Hey everyone, I'm Carlos and welcome to a new book discussion of productbooklab.com. Every month we discuss online a book about product management together with the author and other product colleagues. If you want to find the recordings from our previous discussions and also join us and participate on the upcoming ones, go to productbooklab.com. To find out how to support the book club and help us keep it running without any ads, check the links in the description. Um, so yeah, hello everyone, I'm Carlos and welcome to productbooklab.com where we meet every month to discuss a book related to product management. And today we're going to discuss Converted, the data-driven way to win customers' hearts by Neil Hoyne. And Neil is with us on the call to discuss about the book, to answer some questions, maybe get some feedback. And so yeah, thanks uh, already Neil for, for joining us. Maybe we can start uh, by yeah, yourself giving a quick intro. Quick intro. Well, all right, I'll say that. I would say, I guess, good morning to everyone, depending on where you are, morning, afternoon, evening. It is morning here about 9 a.m. in California. Welcome. Welcome to my home. Uh, this is where I'll be the, the toddlers were just pushed out the door to school. So that, that's for better or worse. Sometimes they like to show up on VC. Uh, a little bit of background about me uh, beyond the, the author part of the book. Uh, hopefully you've come across it. Maybe some of you have read it, which is fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, I've spent a little bit more than the past 11 years working at Google. Uh, everything in the measurement space. So everything from building products to machine learning models to working on commercialization strategies. A lot of my time has just been focused really on working more with external companies across every vertical in nearly every country to understand how they're using data to make different decisions. Uh, outside of that, I'm also a senior fellow at the Wharton School, which allows me to kind of stretch that academic teaching research type thing. Um, but a, a lot of what I do and a lot of my work is what you ended up seeing in that, that book. This book that's, that's very, very, very clearly behind me on the executive bookshelf. It's like, I only have one book. Um, a lot of that is really a distillation of, of what I learned over the past you know, decade plus uh, in this space, which is, uh, even though I come from things from a very marketing oriented angle, there are approaches, as you probably saw, in terms of product development, in terms of executive leadership, in terms of even experimentation and testing. So a lot of crossover. And also, I'll admit a lot of content that was left on the floor. Uh, you know, we wrote a whole bunch of stuff and edited a whole bunch of stuff together with uh, the great people over at Penguin. And, and eventually, you just have to be like, look, you need to focus on an audience. You can't have a book for all things to all people. Um, but at least for the purposes of this conversation, we can take it any direction that you'd like. And I'm happy to offer the best feedback I have, either things I've observed some companies doing with data, what they do right, what they do wrong, where things may be headed. Uh, we can really cover almost anything. Nice. Yeah, and, and, and I, I agree with what you mentioned, right? That I think the book uh, touches a lot of different points and me reading it more as a product manager. At the beginning, I, I think I, we, we also discussed, right? I was, is this more for a marketing audience? But a lot of the points I, I, I found super useful for for me or also for uh, yeah my uh, position or I think also how to bring back all these data points I think even towards the conclusion part you you mentioned one part that I really like about uh, sometimes it's better to sort of like uh, trigger the question right than to handle the answers right which, which I found super interesting I was like that, that that's true right sometimes you show them the data but they're like yeah but when you make it, you get to the question, they're like, aha, I discovered this. And then they get triggered, right? That's, that's exactly what it is. We often wonder. And, and what I kind of give people is I give people this context, because oftentimes when we talk about data and analytics, uh, we think about the power of data, big data, what it can do. And I kind of give everybody the scenario. And I love giving this to product managers as well. As I say, say we were thinking about building a product feature, right? And what I might give you as a PM is I would give you six or seven bullet points. I just slide a, a sheet of paper across the table. I said, here's the feature that we want to build. And it'll give you the basic overview, maybe the, the time it would take to build it, the type of audience, maybe the revenue uplift, maybe some complexities uh, on it. And I would just have one question for all of you, which would be, what do you think? Do you yeah. like the idea or you don't like the idea? Now, there's going to be some people, some PMs will say, I love the feature. Like this is exactly what I was thinking about. Others will say, nah, not, not my thing. But generally for those PMs that are more data driven, what we'll see is the, the unilateral answer to say, I need more data, 
right? Six, six bullet points aren't enough for me to properly vet the feature of the idea. Okay. And that's fair enough. And so being a data guy, what I'll do is over the next, so let's say six to eight weeks, I'll send you more of that data. But you see, I'm, I'm an experimentation guy at heart. So I'm going to do something different. For the PMs that said they love the feature, I'm going to give them a data set. And that data set's going to tell them every reason why it is, if they love the feature, I'll give them every reason why they should hate it. Say all <laughs> the reasons why this is the worst thing you could possibly spend your time building. And then for all those that hate the feature, I'll give you an entirely different set of data that will give you every reason as to why you should build this feature. And then we'll get back together in two months and I'll follow up and I'll say, all right, what have you decided on that feature? And what the research shows is that about 85% of people will keep the exact same decision they had at the beginning. They it will not look at the data at all. In fact, the only thing that changes is that the, the PMs will feel more confident about their decisions because they looked at some data in between, uh, in between now and their original decision. And it just kind of goes to show you that, that more data is not necessarily the solution. And by the way, this isn't limited to PMs. This is not some product manager specific bias, but it goes within that context of how we evaluate features and opportunities that we come with their opinions, even if they're not expressed externally. Some people have asked, I said, well, is it you make a proclamation in front of a group, so therefore you feel like you can't go back? No, these are even just in private settings. Um, and the only thing that really changes anybody's mind and point of view is at the beginning of that decision, reminding the, the PM or whoever it is that because we're human, this is a bias you're going to have. You're going to make a decision and you will be unwilling to accept new data that I give you. As yeah. it turns out, when people are aware of that bias, they will compensate for it. And in those cases, a vast majority of the people will make decisions in line with the data they will later see. But if they don't see it, they just go through. And, and so it just kind of puts things into context to say there is, uh, I guess the way, the way you can most eloquently phrase it is that a lot of the decisions and a lot of the work that I do is balancing both the, the mind, the data-driven intellectual part, as well as the heart, you know, that, that soft, lovable, emotional, often irrational part that makes us so very human. Mm -hmm. and, and I think oftentimes we just think like, well, data will, I, I, I'm not sure if I kept this part in the book, but I certainly say it a lot. We, we often think the data will let us decide, right? Yeah. And often people say, well, the data will tell us. I go in and I say, that's, that's probably one of the largest misunderstandings with data is that there's always a gray area. There's always an uncertainty. There's always enough room to wedge in our opinions and our own biases and interpret that data in a lens that we want to see. And in order to be really effective with building products or tools or reports or marketing campaigns, as I often spend my time on, is understanding where those biases creep in and knowing how to offset them and when maybe to, to allow them in and to say this actually could lead to some type of ideas and explorations that we wouldn't undertake purely on the data alone. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think um, one of the companies I work, they also had a lot of trainings about these uh, bias because they also said, right, uh, we can have and we can get any number to support any point of view that you might already have. But in this, yeah. what you said, right, that maybe the most useful is to be aware of the biases we, we have. Uh, I, I see there is a question on the chat. Maybe, JJ, do you want to make it? Yeah, hi, Neil. Um, your book's awesome, by the way. And, oh, and you. you just touched on this somewhat, um, but, but I've seen that, you know, more and more folks are on the, the data, if, if there is a spectrum of kind of intuition or heart um, and data, right, and how people make decisions. Um, I'm seeing more and more people understand that data can help, uh, but to your point, data is not the end all. So I also have encountered folks who are all intuition. They, I know this domain, I know these customers, I don't need any yeah. data, I don't need your you know, insights, I've got this. Um, how do we move people a little bit more to, towards the middle? And maybe even the, uh, the, the converse, if people are like, give me empir empirical data or I'll never make a decision. Like, how do we get people in that middle? Because to your point, it's not just one or the other. I, I wish I had a perfect answer for it. I'll tell you the way that I approach it generally. I use this, um, I, <laughs> with large CEOs, I use this example sometimes. I said, you know, it, I often think about data and the application of data as, as being a camper in the middle of a forest and you find yourself being chased by a bear. 
And the question is, it's like, well, you need to run away, obviously, um, but you can't run faster than the bear. And so what do you do? And I think a, a lot of people sit there and they're like, all right, well, I need to figure this out. How do I solve this problem? And you realize the solution is, well, you just need to be able to run faster than other campers. And that's a solution. And I think that a lot of times when companies think about these problems, when we think about data, we think about it in a very absolute sense. You're either going to run away from the bear or you're going to die. And you realize, no, 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 there's alternatives here. There's other campers. There's other people we're competing with. And the same thing comes true into business where if, if let's just say that we were trying to chase down the perfect application of data, I think that would be impossible. But I do see a lot of companies, a lot of practitioners sitting there being like, I need to solve this. We need to make a perfect decision. We need to have a perfect synthesis of the data in front of us. Otherwise, we can't possibly go forward with a decision. And any, any element contrary to that is heresy. It'd be like, no, 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 we don't need to be as rigorous with the data. What? Um, and so I just kind of say, as I said, look, the market doesn't reward perfect decision making. The market rewards slightly better decision making than your peers. And that's why when I look at some of those techniques about reminding people of biases or uh, something I think I mentioned in the book is, you know, before when you're running experiments, having firm agreement with the participants uh, before the results are known as to what action will be taken uh, before running that test is, tends to sidestep or reduce some of those biases. It's the same way when in, in doing surveys, you want to put the uh, get the, you know, like the demographic information after the survey questions, as opposed to priming people in advance. I say having that type of toolkit in your pocket and recognizing it allows you to offset the balance in your favor, effectively running faster than other campers, other companies who have not addressed those issues. The gap that I see in the market is that instead of addressing those, most groups just kind of silo those people. It's like, hey, you data people, you sit in the data team and okay, you're, uh, you're, you're more creative in sales and you go over there. And I don't think that's the way to do it. I think the way is to say that both sides are necessary. We just need to figure out how we can reduce some of the friction between it. I couldn't think of a company and people often will ask me because I spend so much time at Google. They say, well, Google's a, a data-driven company. I wish we could be more like Google. 100% of our decisions aren't driven by data. I'd be surprised if 90% of them are. Our success has come in from making slightly more decisions than everybody else in the market. And that's it. That's enough. And sometimes that just takes a little pressure off people to say, sometimes you're going to make decisions with imperfect data. Sometimes you're going to allow intuition and experience to creep in, and that's okay. Just manage it to the best of your ability, educate people on what the biases are, and know that it will be an iterative process where there's still going to be time and frustration. You know, it, was, uh, it actually makes me think of a story. I was mentoring a group of students one time. And these are like these, these programs they do in grad school where it's kind of like, we want you to get real world experience. Mm -hmm. And and it was like a machine learning project. It was fantastic. And the team lead reached out to me about two weeks in. And, and he was he was visibly frustrated with it. And, and I was like, well, what's going on? And he's like, nobody knows what they want out of this project. I was like, the client has data all over the place. There's no alignment on objectives, no alignment on KPIs. It was like, we signed up for this project to get real world experience and nobody knows what they're doing. This is just wasting our time. And I kind of reminded him, like, no, this is this is the real world. This is as real as it gets. Like, you're never going to have perfect alignment with anything. The goal is to figure out how to navigate and to manage that tension, not necessarily resolve it. And so that's just kind of how I frame it. It's a very long answer saying, I expect both to be present in the organization. Any efforts to bring those groups closer together is going to be a net positive. And the goal should never be perfection. That tension will always exist. The metric should just be, are you slightly better at managing it? If you have slightly more tools in the toolkit to pull from, uh, then I think you're going to be better off than the rest of the market. And, and therefore, you'll be able to run away from those other campers. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that's a very nice point that you uh, sort of like remind readers through the book, right? To be very pragmatic also with the approach, right? I, I like that you mentioned at the beginning, just to start with a spreadsheet. At a certain point, you might need something more complicated, but because like you said, I see sometimes people reading these measurement books and machine learning books, and then you think like, oh, it's going to take so much time or like we need to be perfect to begin. So I think it's very market, nice. Market does not reward perfect. My, my gut check was actually this. We do run a lot of experiments. I work with a lot of companies to run a lot of experiments. I had one company that spent six and a half months running an experiment to understand how this one advertising campaign impacted their overall sales. 
And I was like, all right, this is fantastic. And I was, I was really happy with it. And I brought it over to one of the professors that I work with over at Penn. And I was like, what do you think of this study? And, and he kind of looked at it and he kind of smiled. He's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice attempt. And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, I thought this was a real study. He's like, no. He's like, you need repeatability. You need a larger sample size. He's like, you're only looking at a couple months. He's like, you need at least 12 months. And I asked him, I said, how long would it take to study this particular effect, to actually prove it out, to go all the way with it? And he kind of said, you're going to need to carve out at least a year or two years wow. to do it. And then I thought about the practical implications. Could you imagine going to any product manager? It was like, all right, so we want to do something. How long is it going to take to study the problem? Two years. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that's just not feasible. And, and something to remember that we constantly come back to with data is that you have to make compromises with business conditions, even things like lifetime value. The idea of lifetime value is the full lifetime of the customer. You can't operationalize that in a business to be like, so we're investing today and we will see that payback in 85 years. Yeah. That doesn't go anywhere. And so you purposely have to make these compromises across the business. And what I really wanted to go for in the book was to give people the latitude to make those compromises. Whereas I read a lot of data books where it's like, this is the way you have to do something. This has to be perfect or you throw it out. It was kind of to take a step back to say, you can do a lot of things without finding that necessary perfection and you may be better off because of it. Yeah, yeah. You just have to, to get started with it. <laughs> exactly. Something. Just get get moving. Stop, stop thinking. Like it's like those those companies. How many? I won't use the bear metaphor throughout this entire conversation. Everybody will get tired of it. I have other ones I could use, but it's kind of like literally looking at it. They're like I said, like, hey, the bear's chasing us. What do we do? All right, everybody, steering committee. Let's sit down yeah. <laughs> and figure this out. And, and you see companies do this. It's like, hey, we're falling behind. We saw this with, with COVID. We're falling behind in, in products and features for now, this new working from home. What, what do we do? And they sat there for eight to 12 months trying to plan the proper strategy out of it and grasping at data that was terrible. Like McKinsey had a study where they're like, worst case, markets will be back to normal by December 2020. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they pulled that off their website, but they had like the chart. They're like, Best cases, we're back to normal by July 2020. Worst case is December. And companies grappling with this information saying, how do we build a perfect strategy? And the best companies that I worked with were just kind of like, look, we don't know. We accept that uncertainty. And let's do the best we can, given the opportunity cost of not acting yeah. and how we can make better decisions. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I, I want to open also to see if maybe someone else from the call has a question or a comment. I know there are also some... B2B product managers that I always hear with uh, people working on the B2B and data, they're like, oh, how do we get enough? Uh... I may have lost some people when I was like, you don't need perfect data. It's like, ah, the hell with this guy. We do it on. <laughs> and yeah, I do I, respect I data. I just, I know the reality of it. <laughs> so does someone have any uh, question or, or comments maybe want to make? Let's see. Um, otherwise, I, I can make one and then we see also. Uh, you can, you can keep going, Carla, Carlos. You can take as much time as you need. People inter interrupt me, whatever you got. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Please, uh, if you have a question, I, I know sometimes people also have background noise and the internet is not that good. So you can also feel free to uh, type it on the chat and then I, I can make the question. Uh, I, I wanted to ask also because I think a lot of what you talk on the book is indeed to not get a stack or to not um, fixate, let's say, on only the conversion, right? Or only the super short-term um, goal, but well, you advocate a lot for the customer lifetime value and uh, yeah, why that is better that I think, or at least I have read a lot that indeed we should all aim to get there. And I have to be honest, I think one experience with one company that they really said, this is it, we need to do it. Uh, but it was very hard, you know, it was very hard, very hard to get it right, because it's sort of like in the future, so how do you really know, right, you're running experiments, you want to influence that, but then you, you predicted it based on the past, so how is it going to now change, uh, but I think also the biggest challenge was maybe that people had worked so so long with these short-term goals of conversion, and now you give them this complete new goal that is still on an experimentation stage, 
-hmm. And it's a bit more difficult to understand because again, right, it's something yeah. you are sort of predicting. Um, so how, how do you see this, um, yeah, I don't know, like making it a bit more successful that, that deployment, let's say for, for a new company, maybe, I don't know if it's maybe a bit more difficult on early stage. Uh, no, it's difficult. Now. It's difficult for any company. It's difficult for any company, <laughs> different goals, different alignment, but let's, let's even approach this even beyond the idea of lifetime value. Digital transformations, transformations of companies at any type are difficult. Why? Uh, it's not because there's not a net benefit from new technology or new approaches. It's that whenever you move resources within a company, you have winners of that shift and you have losers, right? And a product side, you may find product features that before were popular now in a new perspective, don't look as advantageous. And for those teams, they find their features deprecated. They find maybe a path to promotion and growth harder. They may find their teams with smaller headcount. And mm -hmm. so they fight for their projects. <clears throat> and when you do these types of transformations, if you're not seeing that realignment, I would argue that it's not much of a transformation at all. We transformed our business. What change in your priorities? Nothing. Well, yeah. all right, well, what did you do? And then the same is true, whether you're looking at lifetime value, you're looking at targeting new audiences, new app strategies, it all comes into play. When you move resources, not everyone benefits equally. And oftentimes those people that find themselves on the losing end, and I don't mean to say losing end because a company as a whole is a better, but we'll use it just because that, that binary classifier is a little bit easier. When you find people on the losing end of things, you find now you have created a whole group of detractors to say, in this new world, I'm worse off. And when you have data, which we've already discussed, is uncertain, you have plenty of room to fight. And so that's any, anyone good with data knows the areas to push with on methodology. You really can have, just like that professor I mentioned, you can really push on areas if you want to. It was a, a book I keep on my shelf. I, I, I think this, this book's been around for a while. I don't know if the author, I, I haven't looked at the author, How to Lie with Statistics. Yeah, I know it did. This is a favorite of mine just because it shows how you can take that data in from different lenses presented to different ways. And I insist everybody on my team read it just because it kind of minimizes that. Everyone can talk that language. But the, the question is, and well, how do you get around that? How do any companies transform or adopt new metrics if it leads to that type of positioning? Now, certainly you can get agreement from everybody early on, but you know, they can kind of read the tea leaves to be like, hey, so we're going to move more towards this audience and people will know that they're not included in those plans. What I generally recommend for things like lifetime value is to make the metrics available to people, but not to act on it for three to six months. So in my, in my world in marketing, them. yeah, just, I, I want it to be there. I want to provoke the conversation. And this is how it happened. Uh, I was meeting with uh, an affiliate program. So if you're not in the, the marketing space, uh, affiliate programs are kind of those you click on a link and you get paid. So with credit cards in particular, it was, you know, the, you know, those aggregator sites will help you pick the best credit cards. Those are examples of affiliate. If you click through to the credit card application from those sites, those sites will receive a bounty. Fair enough. And when we looked at their overall performance from, you know, a cost versus application side, incredibly competitive, right? No, how much we were, how much the affiliate was getting paid versus how many applications they were generating made it worthwhile. They were one of the best performers. And then we went through and we started applying this lifetime value lens to say, well, how good are these customers? Do they stick around? Do they hold credit card balances? Are they only in it for the points or the miles that come through? And we found out that a lot of the customers that were coming from this particular affiliate program were terrible. Compared to everyone else, they were the least likely to stick around for more than a year. They'd come in, they'd get their points, they'd disappear. And so the gut reaction when you start looking at lifetime values and say, hey, now we look at this broader perspective. You're giving us a lot of customers. These customers are terrible. And you think, well, first group that should go is these affiliates. Let's cut out these poor customers that we're just wasting money on. And I sat down with the CEO of that company just because I wanted to know. And I said, and I kind of I kind of showed him the data. I said, what do you think? And, and he was completely unsurprised by it. He's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't, I don't, I'm like, I'm like, look here, I'm telling you the customers are delivering to that business. And he corrected me. He's like, look, he's like, I, I'm not paid by the quality of customers I deliver. I'm paid by the volume of customers I deliver. And so if I bring really great customers and I nurture those relationships and I deliver them on the doorstep and they're going to stay for 10 years, I don't see any different incentives versus a customer that's going to leave after three months. 
And that's what you start to realize. You realize that you build entire organizations around the incentives today. And when you suddenly change those, you're going to say, well, these programs were great and these programs were poor, but they, nobody had those incentives before. And so I asked the affiliate program, I said, well, what's your solution? They say, if you're going to pay me based on the quality of leads, and that's a success metric I need to hit, give me a couple of weeks, couple months, and I will deliver you those customers knowing that that is how we're going to be compensated. And it's the same thing within product teams, within marketing teams, within finance teams. When you set the new incentives and you say, this is what we're trying to maximize, they will move towards that goal. When you start showing them in their reports to be like, look, don't change what you're doing, but I want to show you, here's the quality of customers you'll bring in. They're going to look and say, wait a minute, here's two features we have. Both take the same amount of time to implement. Both we expect the same amount of customers to be using, but one will be more popular with the customers that spend the most money with us. Then all of a sudden they're on board, they're engaged. And then you give them time to adapt. This works especially well for product managers. Uh, we see this in, in one of the best areas for lifetime value, mobile gaming. Mobile gaming is incredibly responsive. Where with a retailer, I need about 12, 24 months of data to do lifetime value. I can do it with a mobile game in about 14 days. Wow. People come in and they spend quickly. And what do their product managers do? They are built on lifetime value. They will go through and say, what features can I build that will lead to more high lifetime value customers? And that's how they prioritize it. Not all customers. And I mentioned this in the book that the data really has it that about 0.2% of customers on a mobile game drive 98% of revenue. It's like, well, how do I get more of those people? What are the features those customers like? And that's how they prioritize their features. But if they didn't have that lifetime value metric, they go with pure engagement, number of downloads, number of users, number of clicks on the feature. And so this is just giving them a little focus. But before, if you ever made that transition, you'd have to give them 60, 90, 180 days to say, correct your roadmap with this new information. Let's see how well you can do it before we make those changes. Yeah, I, I, and I think what you have mentioned is indeed another very good point that I also see um, sort of like help sometimes these, these changes, these transformations to fail that you change the framework, you change the process, everything, but the incentives remain the same, right? So like you said, people realize these, have a new process, but end of the day, they're like, wait, I'm not getting paid on this, or this is not what my boss is going to evaluate end of the month, right? So that's, it's interesting to see always point. incentives uh, being a, sort of like a second thought sometimes. Um, well, that's, that's so important. That's, that's where that quote came in. Uh, I think it's towards chapter 13 or 14. It's in the, it's in the third section where you know, one of the best exercises that I get to do with anyone that's in, in the data space, whether it's PMs, whether it's analysts themselves, is to always look at how particular metrics can be manipulated given effective incentives. Because you need to know the levers that can be pulled. You yeah. know, and I have one example in this book about you know, people going through and just you know, having to think, well, we want to boost the total number of social media followers that we have. And what I used to do before this event and these, these services right now, I just feel bad because I know a lot of those people at Twitter where it's like, you know, I can buy, you know, 5,000, 10,000 followers for about $50. And so I'll kind of do that at the beginning of the event is that I'll just create a junk Twitter account, one that was created, you know, and all of a sudden I'll come into me and I'll be like, hey, look at this account that I created. It has thousands of followers already. And everyone just, you know, kind of raises their hand and they're like, but those are garbage followers because you bought them. And I said, well, good. I said, well, how else are we analyzing the success of our campaigns? And then they realized that they're not, that they're just reporting on, well, how many people came through? And so I was like, well, you need to think through all the different ways your numbers can be manipulated because they will be when you throw incentives behind it. And I've seen it from everything from sales quotas to, you know, the only thing you don't really see, actually, even people who comment, they're like, the only number we can't manipulate is revenue. Like that's money. Like you can't fake that. I was yeah. like, well, yeah, you can. You offer a whole bunch of cheap promotions. You front load a whole bunch of sales. Then yeah, you're right. You can bo boost up revenues in the short term. And then the next quarter, they end up dropping because you took all those sales away. But it's just understanding what those dynamics are and those levers. And that's actually for, you know, thinking about even the PM audience. That's one of the things that I think a lot of the more senior PMs have a solid handle on is that when they're looking at that data, not only do they respect the biases that they bring to that perspective, but they also understand how that data and how those metrics can be manipulated given real world conditions. Now, thankfully, yeah. you get a lot of good actors. People are like, no, I don't want to manipulate the data, but I want to have an honest perspective. But other times they'll work with people to say, look, if somebody wants to sell me on this story, 
Like this is what they could do to make this data more compelling, make this opportunity look better. And they know how to pull it apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think another sort of like a practice or, or um, something people do now is also if you have this main metric that you know you can manipulate is to also come up with another counter metric, let's say, right? So then even if the amount of followers goes up, then you also track something else like indeed, right? Maybe revenue per follower. So then you also not only fixate on this super that's, manipulable uh, metric that doesn't say much, right? That, that's, that's, that's exactly what it is. And that's again, why, why I stress that, that lifetime value metric, even for the companies that aren't ready to implement it, is that I like to look at the quality of customers that are being acquired the quality of customers that are using particular features because otherwise you could be sold really bizarre stories. You pick up, you know, going back the daily deal space was a great one. Yeah. I grew up in Chicago where Groupon was based and I'd look out my window. It was like a third floor. We're looking in there. There'd be a restaurant that I know did a lot of Groupons early on and their line during lunchtime would be out the door. Wow. And if their metric was just the number of diners we served or how many new customers we had, Another proxy, the retail websites that say, hey, if you're a new customer, you get 10% off and you get that coupon code. I'm, an, I'm a new customer at some retailers like 40 times because of that. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're just looking at those aggregate metrics, you're saying, oh, wow, wow, we are boosting our KPIs. Our goal was growth. Our goal was new customers. Our, our goal was new app downloads. Our goal was new diners. And you don't have a counter metric like lifetime value to tell you the quality of those customers that you're acquiring. You could get the wrong type of story. Now, eventually, yeah. and thankfully, with the daily deal space, they figured that out. They said, wait a minute, we have all these new customers and nobody's coming back. It was so obvious for them that they could hold on to it. But for a lot of businesses, they just never go back and revisit it. Anybody they acquire, you know, becomes a customer for life. You know, oh, they signed up, they gave us an email, we're going to email them. But they never look at the aggregate impact of those campaigns. They simply say, look, we have 2 million customers. Or I had, um, what did I got? I got this email this morning, which I'm not going to tell you the app, but it just bothers me because I know what they're doing. Uh, VCs, when they're funding, they'll often look at not simply the number of users, but they go a level deeper and they say, I not only want the number of users, I want the number of 30-day actives, All right? I want to know how many people are actually using it. So they send me this email every 30 days that threatens to deactivate my account unless <laughs> I log into the app. Like I got this one last night. It's like, hey, we're going to deactivate your account, which I don't want. I don't want to lose my data. And they're like, make sure you just open the account once every 30 days. So you can do it. And then they have like a big button. Click here to just open the app and take a peek. Yeah. And I'm like, you're, you're not deactivating accounts. I mean, there's no benefit. We want to save storage space. We need to delete that single record. No, you're trying to boost the 30-day active number so that you make it more compelling. There is a... I, I can go on these stories. I, I won't, but I'll tell you one other one just to give you a sense as to what happened in this world. Uh, I was working with a subscription-based company, all right? Now, what this is, the way the subscription-based company works is uh, when you sign up, they offer you three months for free, right? They eat the cost of it. And it is a physical, they're shipping a physical product, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, we're giving you access underneath the paywall. Uh, we will ship you a product. And generally, their costs of doing those types of campaigns are about $100, Okay, so you look at it, one customer acquired, customer acquisition cost, all things being equal, $100. Mm -hmm. Very straightforward measurement. Now, what happens is you get your free product, which is great because you get a $100 benefit. And you call up after that 90 days. And you're like, hey, I had a great time, but it's just not for me. You can't yeah. say, like, oh, we don't want to lose a customer. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you another six weeks for free. No, shit, more free stuff. Okay. And now they have to pay another $50 to keep you around, right? And more costs have to go in to ship you these products. And so now one customer, probably not going to stay. And they've paid $150 for that customer. Now, how do they report it in their internal metrics? A small change. When you call up to cancel, they honor your request to cancel. When you sign up again, they record it as a customer acquisition. And mm -hmm. so instead of one customer that spent $150 to be acquired, they count it in their record as two customer accounts, where one customer was $100, the other one was $50, and now their customer acquisition costs go down to $75 a customer. <laughs> 
And, and this goes on and this happens even with publicly traded companies because there is no standardization around what a new customer is. If, if going back to that retail example, if you fill out a different email address on that form, somebody will go back through and will say, hey, this is a new customer of ours. Look, they filled out, they gave us a new email address. And we all know adding a period to your Gmail address gives you a different account. And most companies don't validate it. So it's like, oh, I want another coupon code. But when they report those aggregate metrics, they say customer growth is up 22%. And so a lot of the success is just being able to untangle those metrics to know where these types of changes can occur. Yeah. <laughs> and you just uh, keep lowering any metric you want. Well, welcome, uh, welcome, to my, welcome to my world. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, and this is also I really like from the book. Like you have so many examples and stories that is uh, very nice uh, to, to read them. I'll, I'll tell you, because I see a question, I want to get to it. I will tell you, this, this is how this book started. Uh, and this will be the next iteration. I, I'm, I'm right in this play. I'm in this phase of my life right now where I have no interest in writing another book. But what people have said, if you've ever traveled to Las Vegas, you may mm -hmm. be able to empathize with this. If not, you may have these own places in your life. Las, Las Vegas for me is a place that I go and then after about three days, I want to leave and never come back. And then after about four or five years, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm watching the commercials on TV. I'm like, hey, that looks kind of fun. I haven't been to Las Vegas in a while. And then I go back to Vegas and I was like, oh, I get it. This is why I haven't been. And then I just yeah. repeat that cycle. People said that's very much like writing a book where you go through this and you're like, God, I'm never going to write a book again. And they say, hey, trust me, two to three years, you're going to be like, that was kind of fun. You're going to start writing a book and you're going to remember why you didn't do it. Uh, so fair warning. But the book originally started with uh, one of the inspirations was there was a professor from Harvard Business School. And, uh, and, and this guy, this guy, Frank, a brilliant sales professor comes up to me and we were just talking. I was like, I, and I was just like, I was just asking him what was on top of mind. And what he said is he said that he's a little bit frustrated with tech because the only stories that tech companies put out are success stories. The same with entrepreneurs and startups. It's here's the product and here's what I built. And he said, and oftentimes they're built from the lens where there's like a hero involved, right? It was like, and here was this great visionary, this entrepreneur that said, we're going to go this way. And all these customers were waiting and it was a huge success case. Yeah. And he said, oftentimes when it comes to building products, building companies, analyzing data and running experiments, we're biased towards those success cases. And the difficulty with them is that when we try to replicate it ourselves, we read these stories. Oh, so this is how this company was. I, I can do this. And he says, and then we hit difficulties and we don't know how to do it. And we think we're abnormal because everybody else had immediate success and everyone else got it right the first time. And so what he actually did was he encouraged me to write some of those stories, those failures. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how the book started. The book started with a collection of essays, which were, these are things that companies really do wrong. Unfortunately, everybody started reading the early drafts of it. And I, I started asking people, I was like, what do you think? And they're like, I love it, but I feel like I need a drink or a new career. <laughs> like, this sounds like a miserable space. And so I was encouraged and said, why don't you write the lessons, what you learned from those stories? And I was like, oh, okay, I wrote the lessons. And then, well, what would you do differently if you did? And I was like, I started writing those. And then we dropped a whole bunch of content and the ones that we kept was we wanted to keep everyone on a similar theme. But I just think, and that's, that's kind of where it came from is because you need to have that idea to say, what does failure look like? Yeah. You know, what is, um, even, a, even a, just another random story for all of you, there's um, a negotiations professor I was working with, teaches negotiations during the day. And if you've ever done a negotiation class, it's very theoretical. They're like, and you need to calculate BATNA and you do all these charts. You're like, what's the counterparty really like? And like, I have, I have no idea. Like, and then it doesn't, it just doesn't work in practice. So one of the things he does is he is also a negotiator um, in real life. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he does uh, divorce settlements. Okay. It was like, God, it's like, you know, like corporate, like two companies discussing a merger or something. It's like two people that now hate each other and want to split their assets. And I, both sides are going to believe it's unfair. And I was like, what, what advice, what, what did you learn from that? And, uh, and he's like, he's like, here's, Here's what I do. He's like, early on, I just tell everybody, I said, this is, this is how I start every negotiation. He said, this is what's going to happen. He's like, about halfway through this process, he's like, you and you are, you're here amicably now, but he's like, trust me, in like a couple sessions, you both are going to be yelling at each other. And one of you is going to be standing at the door, screaming obscenities at the other and then storm out. And everyone sits back and they're like, God, that sounds disastrous. 
Like, why would you tell anybody that? And, and he said, you know, he tells people that because when it happens, he hopes it doesn't, but when it happens, he mm -hmm. can remind everybody that that's part of the process. Yeah. This is something you need to go through in order to make progress. He's like, if I don't mention that, they get halfway through, like, this is a miserable failure. Mm -hmm. And things are worse off now than they were when we started. We have taken steps backwards. And he's like, if yeah. I mention it, most of the times they'll realize and they'll say, you told us this would happen. I said, yes, yeah. this is part of the process. We've reached that stage. And I think oftentimes when we look at pre, you know, professional development, we see too many success stories, too many hero stories. And it's very difficult when you're in that role to then say, when something goes wrong or you're faced with a decision, you're like, I must be a failure. This project is not working. Or I wish even like with some product manager, you'd be like, look, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get to this stage and nobody's going to love your product. This is just part of what it goes. Or you can get frustrated that nothing's working. And then I wish you could just like, you read that and you take a step back to be like, okay, this is the stage where that happens. This is like stage yeah. three of five. It's like my project is going to completely fail. And now I just need to push through to step four. And so it's very much that spirit when you're reading the book that I tried to filter in, which is to say, I don't want you to get discouraged by it. I rather yeah. want to give you a little perspective to say, this is the way things have to go. It, it's part of the process, right? Yeah. Part of the process. But, but I think part, part of that process is also maybe what uh, Marcus is mentioning uh, on that iteration, on that metrics. Maybe, Marcus, do you, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, sure. So thank you, Neil, for all the, the insights and the stories. Um, really, really interesting. I was mostly uh, curious. So starting with imperfect data, I think is, is clear. And that's also kind of where we are currently also in the process here at a kind of B2B, mostly enterprise focused uh, company. Um, but I was wondering then part of the process for us is also to improve the quality of data, iterate on it, but then also kind of still be able to trust the results. And we sometimes kind of have them to restart experiments because there is really a bigger cut sort of in how we define data. And kind of one, one concrete example that I, that I have at hand is changing, for example, the events that kind of define a PQL, a product qualified lead. And we currently do that sort of all, all like every couple of months. And I was just curious, kind of how do we keep up the trust of the stakeholders? So they're not like, oh, yeah, they're just going to change the, uh, the definition anyway again. Is it just by kind of communicating <laughs> yes. the change decision really well? Or kind of what are, what are some pitfalls that you also have seen in, in that kind of process? So I, I will tell you, when it comes to changing KPIs and milestones, you're right, because there are ripples that come through there, right? People align, and then all of a sudden, they feel like the ground is shifting underneath their feet. Where possible, and this actually ties neatly into the story we were just talking about, Carlos was right, is that I do try to set that, those expectations early on. So for instance, some of the machine learning projects, we don't discuss this in the book, but around lifetime value, companies will often look for those signals that suggest high or low lifetime value. And those signals will change. And the only way that I can manage that change is I tell people early on, I said, if we're still using these same signals in three months, we're doing something wrong. And I look at the same way within individual metrics. As I set the expectation up front that part of the process is changing those metrics and to expect that those metrics will be changed. If I don't do that, then people think I'm second guessing myself. And so that's number one. Number two is, if I don't have that type of support, or maybe I need a little bit more support, I have to bring the stakeholders that are involved into the process itself so that they can see it. I touch on this a little bit towards the end of the book about uh, how I made an ass of myself in front of a group uh, when I was presenting lifetime value, where I gave them the answer. I kind of gave them the new metric. And I said, you can't look at this. You have to look at this. And they, they felt like, you're right. Why, why are we changing the goalposts? And part of the reason, part of the way that I surface it now is I let other decision makers come along in the journey. So for instance, if I were to see a change in behavior that's occurring with users, where I thought before these types of users were our target, and now we have a new type of user. Instead of going through and simply saying, look, we identified a new user, we're changing our KPIs. I would just surface the very basic data to say, this is what the market looked like during COVID, for instance. This is what the market looks post-COVID. And invariably, somebody asks a question and they say, well, what are we doing to adjust for this audience? Or what adjustments are we making? And then I'm just the provider of information and I allow the group to come to the consensus that something needs to be changed. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're happy and say, hey, we wanna keep doing it. But it's at that point, it's the same way as like with, with lifetime value. Here's the data. We're investing in all customers evenly, even though these customers will spend more. And I have to let them prompt it to say, well, why are we doing this? Why aren't we spending more on valuable customers? 
And so that way, I'm just a conveyor of information. What I look at as my role is not to tell them what the right metric is, but to walk them through the decision-making process so they can internalize it, they can own it. And so when they go back to their desk, it's not, well, Neil changed the KPI. It's no, Neil just brought us data and we made a decision as a group that this is a better KPI to attach to. Experimentation, same thing. Experimentations can be difficult. The standard that I hold for experiments can be fairly high. So what do I do? I give the choice to the group about the type of experiment they want to run. And I let them see the trade-offs. So I'll say, look, I can run a sloppy pre-post test. <laughs> you will have a result in one week. Or I can do the full academic model and you will have a result in three to four years. Or in between, I have plenty of shades of gray where I am introducing error for a trade-off of time and maybe marketing expense. Tell me where you want to fall on this chart. How important is this decision? Is it something we can reverse? Is it something we can't? But that way they're bought into it. They're the ones making the decision. I'm simply giving them the options. And so if I come back and everybody agrees that they want to run a pre-post test, then that's what I'll run. And I don't expect any disagreement when I bring the results back to the group and the group like, well, you, you simply took an arbitrary two weeks and turned something on or off because that's what they agreed to. Um, but I just found that like with experiments, with data, other people have to see the intuition of the decision-making process as opposed to the answer because sometimes they're just not willing to accept it. And it's the same thing is that even if I want to change KPIs, I need them to see the rationale, the reason, the change in behavior so that they can reach the same conclusion that I have. Uh, otherwise, I know I won't get their support and I just kind of be like that, that guy from on high that says, and now we're going to go do this metric. And that just never holds. So I hope, is, that, is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. It also kind of reminded me a little bit now, um, actually this week also, we, we presented them for the PQL, for example. We looked into our current definition and we, we looked into kind of how well does it work and what other possibilities would there be and so on. And then kind of or organically also on that call and during that discussion, right, um, our boss was asking them like, so are you going to change the definition of the PQL? So this, this is kind of right, really, then I think kind of just in line also with, you, with what you mentioned, right? Like not going there and saying like, hey, I'm going to change this and it's different now, but just bringing up the, what we have learned or kind of the, the insights and it will come up in the conversation then, yeah, really cool. And I said, I also like, are you going to change it? No, we're changing it. <laughs> and in fact, you know what? We get into this with one of the areas of lifetime value. Uh, we we kind of skip over it, but there's often that question where one of the more common questions I get from CFOs is say, so you're doing lifetime value now? So yes, yes, I am. Okay. What, what's a lifetime? I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, you, you really? And I'm like, yeah, the full lifetime of the customer. That's what we're doing. They're like, bullshit. We're not doing that. I was like, why not? And they're like, I can't go back to my board and say, look, we're investing customers several decades from now. And I'm like, well, how do we decide? Now, what a lot of companies will do is they'll go through and they'll pick an arbitrary line in the sand. Like I've had some, I've had some groups that say, we're going to do a six month lifetime value. I was like, six months, what does that do? They're like, well, because then our customers will pay us back after six months and then everything else is gravy. The company's not doing so well now. Uh, and they'll say, is it three years or is it five years now? The answer that I prefer is lifetime. That's my point of view. That's, that's how I measure things, right? But I don't have that operational lens. And so what do I do? How do I navigate that exercise? Similar with experiments. With experiments, I can say, this is what I recommend. This is the right answer per se. Or I can give them a list of choices with the trade-offs with it. And it's the same thing. What I'll do is I'll calculate lifetime value. I'll say, look, here's your three month. Here's your three year. Here's your five year. Here's your lifetime. All right. This is what the numbers look like. And I will tell them what are the trade-offs by using different methodologies. If you use a three-year trade-off, you're going to lose these particular customers and how much value you're not going to capture because you're making that trade-off. If you go with five-year, if you go with lifetime, in some cases even, there's no difference between three, five, and lifetime. You target the same people, in which case it's a, it, the debate is moot. It doesn't matter. But I like to make it because then they're aware of those trade-offs. The organization is aware of those trade-offs. To say, if you're really going after a six-month lifetime value, I want you to know how many customers you're leaving behind. If you're going after a simple pre-post test, I want you to know where you're injecting a lot of error, where you could make poor decisions. And sometimes walking to people through that process, bringing them in to that discussion, that builds the buy-in and support that you need because they see what you see. 
And so then what you're doing is you're getting them to trust in the data that you have, not necessarily trusting in the conclusion that you reached. And so those are two different things. They're either trusting you as an individual, which is kind of strange. That's going with the heart. Or they see the data and they're making those trade-offs to say there's implicit balances that we have to have as an organization, in which case you're pulling in more from their expertise. And so that's how I do it. I love to give people choices. I know what the right answer is. I'm certainly not hesitant to share it with them, but I need them to come to that conclusion with what they see and what they're willing to support. Yeah. And I think also another thing that now I remember is what you mentioned, I think it's super good, right? You set the expectations that there will be failures or we will keep improving. But I think also yeah. when we say it's part of the process, sounds a bit like there is an end state where we're going to reach the perfect KPI and never look at it again, right? And I think reminding people also that end of the day, it's, it's, it's an abstraction of something we want to measure and we should probably keep looking at it, right? And always try to improve, right? So I think also yeah. discussing that, that we're going to reach one KPI, we think is better than before, but that also doesn't mean that that's it, right? We never revisit it. That's the thing. The only thing that I, I will say that I don't do is, I, and this is, by the way, where a lot of trust issues come up in companies, is that because of the power that data has, people are always worried, again, with that transformation, whether it's going to lifetime value, whether it's changing a KPI, I find that groups are generally more concerned about some of the political incentives that may be involved with that decision to say, mm -hmm. are we moving to lifetime value because this team knows they're going to get larger budgets? And that's often the pushback is they start thinking, they're like, well, what's happening? Why are people making this decision? Yeah. And instead by giving them the data and giving them some buy-in into the decision-making process by bringing them to the table, it doesn't necessarily lead to what I would call perfect decision-making. I don't think perfect decision-making works really well sometimes with committee, but I mm -hmm. find it's a lot easier to implement in a complex organization with different incentives if everyone can support the decision around the table for what direction they should go next. There's always gonna be someone that may need to make that hard decision to say, yes, we're going to do it. But generally, if they know the data, I find building that intuition, building that story to be more helpful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I see there is one question now from Ruslan. Ruslan, do you wanna ask it? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I just wanted to know if it's okay to accept the results of an experiment if the hypothesis was wrong, but the outcome turned out to be positive at the end. For example, we wanted to improve sales, but um, yeah, it turned out that we impacted uh, customer support um, uh, requests, for example, um, to be less. And then, yeah, we decided to still roll out this feature because yeah we didn't improve what we wanted initially but for business is still good so basically we made up the hypothesis based on the out, actual outcome of the test uh, mm -hmm. but not the initial mm -hmm. idea of course yeah it's almost a, almost like failing up uh <laughs> i would <laughs> i would say this I, I think the goal of experiments is is simply a vehicle of learning more about how markets and customers respond. I am okay if experiments succeed. I am okay if experiments fail. As long as I learn something, as long as I learn something about how a customer base, a business, a market responds that I can apply to future decision-making. Uh, I don't have a lot of buy-in to say, hey, I came up with a hypothesis. I need it to be true. I have a question to say, if I came to a conclusion from an experiment in this case, uh, an opportunity to improve sales, as long as I believe the methodology and the rigor by which that conclusion was reached, and I have an opportunity to apply that new information somewhere in my business, then I consider as a whole, that experiment was a success, even though the particular hypothesis was disproven. Where I get most frustrated is in cases where even where we prove a hypothesis or a hypothesis validated, but we don't know the dynamics or the levers underneath that drove to it. So if I know why something was successful, it's great. If I know why something failed, that's great. If I don't know what happened and I didn't learn anything that I could apply apart from, well, I guess this works, then those I consider to be the most frustrating. Uh, the, the practical analog that I say is oftentimes with sales meetings. You go into a sales meeting, generally they have like, they, they love doing the, the red, yellow, green thing on your metrics. And they go through and they're like, you know, like, hey, like, Bob, your, your number's green. Great work. 
And they're like, oh, Carl, your number's red. What are you going to do to fix that? And, and the best organizations that I've come across are ones that if somebody's numbers are green, they get equal scrutiny as someone's that numbers that are red. You're green. They want to know what made it successful. What did you do? How do we know that you were the variable that mattered? And it just wasn't that we botched the quotas or the forecasts are wrong or the market's growing faster. And if your numbers are red, same level of scrutiny. How do we know it was you and just something that didn't happen in the market? And in both cases, what, it's very similar to experiments, which is to say, if those people are green and they're seeing success, but they don't understand why, they don't understand the drivers, then we should be equally frustrated than a person that's underperforming that doesn't know the drivers of their market and what they can change. But it's a lot of times these companies inherently believe it's like, oh, well, if they're green, then whatever they're doing is working and we will focus on where we see the problem. And the problem is often more holistic. The same way with experiments is the goal is to learn so that you can apply those learnings to improve the business holistically, not simply to get a particular result in that moment. And so which to back to your question, I'm ideologically flexible on it. I say, as long as something was learned that could be applied, I consider the test as a whole to be a success, even if that hypothesis was disproven. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And, and, and I've seen that happening indeed sometimes, or especially when uh, companies start running experiments that they see the goal of having those positive ones, right? Where I tell you like, and, and maybe it's also linked to what you mentioned at the beginning that companies will usually publish like, oh, we had this super successful experiment that increased this metric, right? And yep. then everyone wants to do experiments because they expect only the positive ones. So I think it's good to also hey, remind my, that, that 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 happens. In my, my last yeah. note, I, I, I will share with you. I've had, a, I have had some people that come to me and they're like, we want to run more experiments as a company. That's, that's the lesson they take away. And I'm like, all right, great, yeah. great. What are we going to do? They're like, we need uh, experiments 90, 95% chance that they're going to be successful because we don't want to waste money. And I've also had other companies that come in and they're like, we need to run more experiments. I was like, great. And they're like, give us anything you have. Yeah. And I'm like, how risky you want? They're like, we don't care. And I'm like, why? And they're like, well, because our incentives, our bonus is only paid out if we run 35 tests as a team. It doesn't matter if they work or not. And that's yeah. again, going back to that thing to say, you can set quotas and KPIs, but you need to know those levers as to how it will impact the decisions you make after. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm looking at the time. Just want to make sure uh, we don't run over. So maybe now we can take a, a picture with the ones that uh, well, want to turn on the camera, the ones maybe that have the, the book. Uh, and then we can now put the book and let's... Uh, hey, there's your Kindle. Picture. <laughs> exactly. So, okay. Three, two, one. Awesome. All right. Um, well, thank, thanks everyone for, for joining, for listening, for their questions. Neil, thank you very much. Uh, very nice to finally speak with you. I know we have been exchanging emails for a while. Uh, no, but yeah, pleasure. thanks for joining. Pleasure is entirely mine. Thank you everybody uh, as well for attending, uh, for reading the book, for your interest in this subject. I also encourage if you're ever curious, you're always free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I actually do reply to all my messages. If you have questions, content, ways I can help you in your work, data-driven discovery going forward, it's this week. It's a year from now. Always feel free to reach out. I only got here because other people helped me. So if there's anything I can do to help you in your work, please feel free to take me up on the same. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Have Thank a great you. Day. Hey, everyone. I'm Carlos and welcome to a new book discussion of productbooklab.com. Every month we discuss online a book about product management together with the author and other product colleagues. If you want to find the recordings from our previous discussions and also join us and participate on the upcoming ones, go to productbooklab.com. To find out how to support the book club and help us keep it running without any ads, check the links in the description.